All right. Good evening. Good evening. I hope everybody's week's going great so far. Uh, I will say, continue to pray for Miss Pat Zimmerly. Um, getting out of the hospital today, but we went and saw her. She's doing okay with her back aches, uh, but just continue to pray for her. That's not fun. Um, lesson 10 tonight. Lesson 10. We're doing good on this series. I really do hope you've enjoyed it. I, I really like looking at uh, characters in scripture and just kind of some of their faithful steps that they've taken in service to God. But we'll be in 1 Samuel tonight. 1 Samuel chapter number 16. Look at a pretty familiar character in scripture tonight. 1 Samuel 16. Let's read uh, the first 13 verses here together. It says, And the Lord said unto Samuel, How long wilt thou mourn for Saul, seeing I have rejected him from reigning over Israel? He says, Fill thine horn with oil and go. I will send thee to Jesse the Bethlehemite, for I will provide me a king among his sons. And Samuel said, How can I go? If Saul hear it, he will kill me. And the Lord said, Take an heifer with thee and say, I am come to sacrifice to the Lord. Uh, and call Jesse to the sacrifice, and I will show thee what thou shalt do, and thou shalt anoint unto me him who I name unto thee. And Samuel did uh, that which the Lord spake, and came to Bethlehem, and the elders of the town trembled at his coming, and said, Comest thou peaceably? And he said, Peaceably, I am come to sacrifice unto the Lord. Sanctify yourselves and come with me to the sacrifice. And he sanctified Jesse and his sons and called them to the sacrifice. And it came to pass when they were come that he looked at Eliab and said, Surely the Lord's anointed is before him. And the Lord said unto Samuel, Look not on his countenance nor on, or on the height of his stature, because I have refused him. For the Lord seeth not a man as man seeth, for man looketh on the outward appearance, but the Lord looketh on the heart. Then Jesse called Abinadab and uh, made him pass before Samuel. And he said, neither hath the Lord chosen this. And Jesse called Shammah to pass by. And he said, neither hath the Lord chosen this. Again, Jesse made seven of his sons to pass before Samuel. And Samuel said unto Jesse, the Lord hath not chosen these. Samuel said unto Jesse, Are here all thy children? And he said, There remaineth yet the youngest, and behold, he keepeth the sheep. And Samuel said unto Jesse, Send and fetch him, for we will not sit down till he come hither. And he sent and brought him in. Now he was ruddy and with all uh, of a beautiful countenance and goodly to Goodly to look to, and the Lord said, Arise, anoint him, for this is he. Then Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the midst of his brethren. And the Spirit of the Lord came upon David from that day forward. So Samuel rose up and went to Ramah. Let's pray, and then we'll get into this tonight. Uh, we'll look at the journey to the Valley of Allah, and then we'll continue on. Let's pray. Lord, just what a wonderful day it's been. I'm just thankful uh, for the opportunity to gather together. Together just to uh, meet with like-minded individuals to so open up your word, Lord, as we continue to look at these uh, historic characters from scripture. Lord, I just pray that we're able to apply um, these stories of their faithful journeys to our lives. Lord, I just pray that as we continue uh, in these stories, even though some of the stories are very familiar to us, I pray that we're able to glean something from them, uh, maybe an area where we've lacked, maybe an area where we uh, are weak. Lord, and I just pray that we are strengthened because of what your word shows us. Be with us tonight, Lord. Be with everything that I say. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, it's interesting, uh, looking at those giant redwoods in Northern California, uh, one of the places I would like to go one day, right? I've never actually been there to see them, but from what I hear, they're massive trees, right? You see the people who are standing at the bottom of them and they're like this big and cars driving through them and the cars are this big. And it's like, man, that's amazing to me. Right? It speaks to just how awesome those trees are, the might, the, the strength that it takes to endure uh, everything that life throws at them in order to grow that big. It's uh, been said that one of them measured, this was back in the year 2000, but one of them measured to be uh, almost 400 feet high, right? 378 feet. That's a big tree, right? I'm only like 300 
No, I mean, that's huge, right? And it just speaks to how awesome our God really can be. But some of those trees, right, these coastal redwoods, you could call them, they've been growing for some 2,000 plus years. I mean, that's, that's a long time for a tree to grow. That's a, that's a lot of endurance, especially on the coastline. Hey, especially to be in California, right? California's crazy. I mean, that's a long time to be there. And you think of what was happening 2,000 years ago. Julius Caesar was the ruler of the Roman Empire. Right? Around 2,000 years ago, Jesus was born in a manger. Around 2,000 years ago, some of these redwood trees were getting planted. Right? They were beginning to sprout up. I mean, all of the history that occurred during just that lifetime of a tree. I mean, that, that's cool to me. Right? I don't know of many trees that have been around much longer. I mean, I've planted trees and they don't even last very long. Right? It just happens that way. But you think of, of the grandeur of these trees and everything, and we got to think of looking at things like that, especially in our world, how awesome our God is, right? how powerful our God is, the one who created such a wonder for us to look at. Right? It's interesting because there's no known killing diseases that infect the redwood trees. Right? Any insects that are associated with these trees, they don't cause any uh, significant damage. It's very insignificant to them. Fire is actually their worst enemy, but even the fire cannot kill these giant redwoods because the bark on these trees is just too thick. I mean, there's very little that can harm these trees because of how they've grown, because of what they've been through. We can see here in chapter 16 of 1 Samuel, right, David. Right? We, we see this, this image of David coming into play and we can see uh, Samuel anointing him to be the next king and, and the process. And we'll look at what's going to take place through tonight's study. But David, right, he's, he's familiar to everybody. He's a, a man after God's own heart. Right? This is David. Right? No king in Israel was more loved, what was uh, uh, more mentioned in scripture, in history. Uh, no one more compared to than David in scripture. I, I mean, David was this guy. Everything he went through, though, he, he was a giant among men. He faced giants among men. I mean, this, this was David. His, his heart was so focused on God. This is what I want us to start to look at tonight. His heart was so focused on God that nothing could destroy his passion for him. Where's our focus on God? He stood firm when he was ridiculed for God's sake. He, he, he stood boldly, right, against those who would uh, uh, try to belittle, defame his God. He, he would make the stand. And this man of God was used in tremendous ways to establish the faith of the children of Israel, right? To bring this nation uh, out of uh, kind of this obscurity, right, into a world power. I mean, David was a mighty man of God. We kind of looked last uh, week when we were looking at um, Samuel and, and, and we understand wanting to be like, or the children of Israel rather, they were wanting to be like the other nations. Give us a king, right? I want to be like everybody else. And that, that's such a dangerous mindset to be, especially as children of God. I want to be like everybody else. Why? You're the child of a king, the king. Uh, the almighty God. Why would we want to be like everybody else? And Samuel then anointed Saul to be Israel's king. And then only a few years into his reign, right? Saul began to organize and command Israel's armies of the day to fight important battles against the Philistines. And all of this was taking place. But understand that the time came when uh, uh, Samuel was to appoint a new king for specific reasons. And we'll look at that tonight. You know, when the men of Israel saw in chapter 13 of 1 Samuel 6 and 7, as the Philistines prepared for battle, right, these the, the Israelites of the day, they began to tremble. They were hiding. They were, they were, they were scared stiff, 
right? First Samuel 13, six and seven. When the men of Israel saw that they were in a strait for the people were distressed, then the people did hide themselves in caves and in thickets and rocks and in high places and in pits. And some of the Hebrews went over Jordan to the land of Gad and Gilead. As for Saul, he was yet in Gilgal and all the people followed him trembling. I mean, this is what happens when you cry for things that God never intended for us to have. There, there's there's an a, uh, um, issue there. We, we can't uh, faithfully, uh, strongly follow God. I mean, Saul grew tired of waiting during this process of the children of Israel fleeing. And he took matters of the sacrifice into his own hand. And we saw what happened because he offered this sacrifice. God's like, you're done. I'm finished with you. And that's where we kind of pick up, right? Because of Saul's behavior, God rejected him from being king. And now the new king was being chosen. Number one in your notes there, we can see David's calling. David's calling. Go ahead and jump down to letter A. It says the purpose of David's calling. You know, there's a purpose. God sent Samuel to the house of Jesse, Right, David's dad, he sent him there for he had chosen uh, one of Jesse's boys to be the next king of Israel. In 1 Samuel 16, verse number one, it says, And the Lord said unto Samuel, How long without mourn for Saul, seeing I have rejected him from reigning over Israel? Fill thine horn with oil and go. I will send thee to Jesse the Bethlehemite, for I have provided me a king among his sons. I mean, two reasons that we could see the new king was being established uh, in Israel. The Lord had chosen this new king to take place. First of all, Saul was the king chosen of the people. Now, you know, it's an interesting thought. The scriptures record that the people were demanding the king. We want to be like everybody else. He was king of the people's will, not of God's will. God never intended for there to be a king in Israel. That's not how he established things. He had judges, he had prophets, he had priests, right? But the people cried for it and they mourned. I mean, that we want to be like them, have a king to rule over us. That's the people's will, not God's. Secondly, we can see the, the new king was being established because God was looking for a man after his own heart. He wanted somebody who was ready, willing to follow him, right? David, God's choice for the next king, not the people's choice, not even Samuel's choice, right? Not Jesse's choice, not I'm sure his brother's choice, just this ruddy little kid, right? This is who God established. He had a heart for God. He wanted somebody who wanted to know him, to desire, to follow him, to obey all of his commandments, not just because they looked good physically, not just because they had the, the best abilities or the greatest talents. He wanted somebody who was just willing and able to follow them because of their faith, their trust, who God was. It was a condition of his heart that David was established into kingship. First Samuel 6, 7 says, but the Lord said unto Samuel, look not on his countenance or on the height of his stature because I have refused him for the Lord seeth not as man seeth for man looketh on the outward appearance, but the Lord looketh on the heart. We, we fall into this, unfortunately, this tragic situation. I've seen it over and over in Christian circles in churches and it, admittedly, I've done it myself and I just had this conversation a couple times today actually with different people. We get visitors on Sunday, we'll say. Two different families. One family shows up and the kid's got a little calyx sticking up. Maybe a little bit of a chocolate milk stain. Right? Maybe dad's in a polo and some, and some jeans and mom comes. Maybe she's in a skirt and, and it's like, okay, hey, we're glad that you're here. Uh, uh, have a seat. We're, we're happy that you're here. But then the next visitors show up and they come in and they're, they're in their Sunday best. Right? Dad's got a suit on, tie. I mean, double Windsor, everything. 
right? Mom comes in, uh, she's got the lovely dress, slight heel, but not too high, but not too low, just enough to fit into the mold, right? Junior comes in and he's even wearing suspenders and a little bow tie and the hair's parted beautifully. And what happens? Oh, it's so wonderful to have you. This is who we need in our church, right? Why? Because the initial impression, this, these people agree like we agree. Look how they're dressed, right? Look how they're behaving. But we got to take this into mind. Hey, Samuel, look not on his countenance. Don't look on the height. Don't look on his stature. Hey, hey, don't, don't think about that. The Lord looketh on the heart. I, I've seen greater lives change when somebody comes in and they look a little bit rough. But I, I'll tell you what, they're the ones who are still serving. They're, they're the ones who are still excited about God. You know, David's heart, uh, 23rd Psalm, you know, that funeral psalm. But it's such an important psalm for us just to picture because we can see David's heart. And I have this in the notes here. It says a believing heart. He had a believing heart. The Lord is my shepherd. He's my shepherd. He had a teachable heart, right? He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He's showing me the ways to go. He had a holy heart. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness, right? He had a confident heart. Though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. Why? He had a thankful heart. My cup runneth over, he says. He had a fixed heart. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. That was David's heart. That, that, that's, we could see the purpose of David's calling because he was somebody who had a heart for the things of God. Let her be there. You can see the process of David's calling. There was a process, right? God guided Samuel through the process of selecting the next king to rule over God's chosen people. And while Samuel was clearly looking on appearance at first, God's selection, right? It, it wasn't based on these physical uh, um, attributes, the abilities, the talents, the looks, right? The presence of hair, right? Those types of things. That's not what God was looking at. Jesse brought his sons before Samuel and Samuel saw uh, Eliab and he's like, man, this is the one. And God's like, no, it's not. And let me bring in the brother. No, it's not. Let me bring in the brother. No, it's not. I mean, it got to a point. The, the man of God says to you, bring your sons before me. And he didn't even bring them all. He just brought seven. Why? Because David, that, that's just David. He's just out there. Don't, don't worry about David. Don't, don't, don't think about David. But God was looking at the heart, right? God was specifically looking for something. First Samuel 16, in verse number seven, it says, But the Lord said unto Samuel, quit looking on the outside. We, we got to get that instilled in our brains. We, we, we are very uh, quick to judge people based on appearance. There's a pastor friend um, of mine. Uh, he used to come and speak at our church in Phoenix every now and then. And he had a, a somewhat larger church uh, there in Tucson. And he would show up and he was telling the story. I may have mentioned it before about how he wore the same tie two weeks in a row. He wore the tie and he showed up the next week. He had the same tie on. Well, you don't think about it. At least I don't. Right? Okay, that's fine. Well, he showed up and he gets done with the service. People are exiting. Good sermon, pastor, good sermon. This man comes up and says, that's the exact same tie you wore last week. And he left. He says, that's what you got out of today? Like that, that's what you took away? You're looking on the outside here. You know, well, what do you mean? He said, I wore that tie for two months straight. I said, good for you. Right? Hey, it's not about this. It's about what God is trying to reveal to us. I mean, Samuel went through seven different sons, but God didn't approve a single one of them. God said, nope, 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 nope. Right? Those aren't them. Then Jesse remembered, oh yeah, I got, a, I got somebody out in the field. Oh, oh yeah. It's like an afterthought. It couldn't be him. 
It's interesting to think about this. God is looking for people with a heart for him and a desire to follow his word in obedience. Not just somebody who's willing to play a part. Acts 13, verse number 22 says, And when he hath removed him, he raised up unto them David to be their king, to whom also he gave testimony and said, I have found David, the son of Jesse, a man after mine own heart, which shall fulfill all my will. Someone wrote to a missionary friend just after his friend had been um, ordained to the ministry and said, in great measure, according to the purity and perfections of the instrument will be the success, right? He, he says, it is not great talents God blesses so much as great likeness to Jesus. I love that. He says, a holy minister is an awful weapon in the hand of God. Someone who is holy and willing to serve, who's willing to follow God is an awfully powerful weapon in the hands of God. Man, I, I like, I believe it was D.L. Moody said, uh, the world has yet to know what a man fully committed to God could do. Someone who's truly after serving God. Think of the might of that. Right? We see the selection of David and what that was taking place. But there's a sanctification of David that takes place kind of beginning in verse number 13 of chapter 16. Right? He, he took that horn of oil. He anointed him in the midst of his brethren. And the spirit of the Lord came upon David from that day forward. You know, when he, he took that, that horn of oil and he began to pour it over David's head, he was anointing him to be the next king, right, of Israel. But in the Old Testament, that oil, it, it was very much symbolic, right, to the Holy Spirit coming upon an individual, right? The Holy Spirit moving in to, to anoint that person with, with power and, and with wisdom and with ability to then serve God in the way that God has planned for them to do so. That's what that's picturing, it was this uh, symbol of the Holy Spirit moving. It was the, the confirmation that this is the man of God. David, you are the one, right? It says the spirit of the Lord came upon David from that day forward in verse 13. From that moment on, man, the, the spirit of God was moving powerfully in him. You know what? God has given us the same spirit as Christians, he, he has blessed us with the presence of the Holy Spirit in our lives. The moment of salvation, when you accept him, he says, guess what? I'm going to work inside you. I'm going to empower you to now work for me. I, I'm going to empower you to then do things for me in service to me. He, he's going to comfort and direct and he's going to strengthen our hearts by the interworkings of the Holy Spirit. Man, that's one of the reasons I like having the fruit of the Spirit up here um, on our walls. Man, that, that, that's such a wonderful reminder. That's, that's one of my favorite things. Uh, Galatians 5 there, looking in Scripture. Man, what a wonderful picture of what we can do as Christians. Man, I, I can properly perform all of these things in my life. Every aspect of these fruits of the Spirit I have access to. You know how that happens, Ephesians 5, 18. Be not drunk with wine wherein is access, right? But be filled with the Spirit. Be filled with the Spirit. Acts 1, 8. But ye shall receive power. Hey, you're going to get power. That's where we get the word, right? It's dynamos, right? Getting dynamite. That's explosive kind of power. That's wonderful power. After, after what? That the Holy Ghost has come upon you. When the spirit of God moves in, that's when you're going to get the power. And although Samuel anointed David to be king that day, it's actually going to take many years for him to assume the position. But during uh, that time, during that process, after that which the Holy Ghost had come upon him, while David waited, while he was still tending the sheep, working the field, while well, being steadfast, watching, waiting, right, his journey of faith, Every step of the way, God was preparing him for the role that he would play as king. That's a wonderful thing. Why? Because number two, David's cause, his cause. For Samuel 17, we see the fight, right? When Goliath comes into the picture, 
right? That, that, that's the chapter everybody knows. David and Goliath, right? When this teenage boy takes a stand against a man who was over nine feet tall, right? God gave David a cause and that cause was to honor and to glorify him in everything that he did. We're, you know, we're given that same cause in scripture. Whatsoever you eat or drink or whatsoever you do, do it all to the glory of God. Everything that we do should lend itself to glorifying our heavenly father. That's our cause. You know, his cause was for faith. David's cause letter A there was for the faith. It came about, and, and we could read through this, but for sake of time, we won't. First Samuel 17, as you're reading through that story, he, he comes to a point, and we're seeing the threat of the enemy, right? Goliath at this point, right? He's getting up on, on this side of the valley, on, and the children of Israel on the other side, and he's standing there, and he's coming out, and he's mocking them. He's coming out and he's just basically, you bunch of babies. Will you go home to your mama? I don't know what he said exactly. Okay, but he's coming out and he's taking this stance before the children of God, mind you. And he's just basically calling them a bunch of cowards. Hey, why don't you, you pick your strongest man and uh, he'll come down and me and him will fight. I mean, God's army was petrified. They were, they were scared. That, 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 that's so difficult for me to understand. And yet, we live that on a daily basis in today's society. The enemies of God are constantly working, but the children of God just stand stiff. Why? Because we don't want to take a stance that uh, uh, maybe will uh, cause somebody to not like me or, or to, to have a bad opinion or, or, or maybe uh, um, they'll, they'll think bad thoughts of me or call me a bad name. And we get scared about what people will do. You know, in 1 Samuel 17, we also see this, this concern that, that comes upon David because he's looking at his brothers who are serving in this army Right, And he's going like, wait a minute, what is taking place here? You're up against an enemy of God and you're unwilling to do anything. I mean, David, here, here he is, right? He, he aimed at nothing but the glory of God. He, he stood for God when nobody else would. So then the question comes to us looking at stories like this, are we willing to stand for God? Are we willing? Do you give the track to that person? Do, do, do you tell anybody about Christ? Do, do you invite anybody to church? Are we willing to say, no, my family doesn't act that way, behave that way. We don't do these things. Why? That's standing for God. We got to live for that cause. David understood his purpose. He was to glorify God with who he was in and out, right? Everything that he did, this is my role. This is my cause of being. That's our cause today. In chapter 17, verse number 29, right? That question comes about and David said, what have I now done? Is there not a cause? Man, that's so powerful. I understand that. Is there not a cause? 2 Timothy 1, 11 and 12 says, Whereunto I am appointed a preacher and an apostle and a teacher of the Gentiles, for the which cause I also suffer these things. Nevertheless, I am not ashamed, for I know whom I have believed and am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have committed unto him against that day. I, I'm not ashamed of God. I, I'm not ashamed to take the stand. Look at David's life as a young teenager. I mean, th this is a kid. Right? And, and we look at kids and we go, ah, they can't do anything for God. And yet this man, he, he went before the entire armies of the land and he took a stand for God. Because why? Because the adults wouldn't do it. Letter B, his cause was challenged though. Right? Let her be. His cause was challenged. 
I mean, David was criticized before he says, is there not a cause? His brother, basically in verse number 28, his brother is criticizing him. He's like, what, what are you talking about? I'll read it here. It says, and, and, and Eliab, his eldest brother, heard when he spake unto the men, and Eliab's anger was kindled against David, and he said, why camest thou down hither? And with whom uh, hast thou left those few sheep in the wilderness? I know thy pride and thy naughtiness of thine heart, for thou art come down that thou might see the battle. I know why you're here, brother. You, 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 you just want to see the battle. You, you just want to get away from all the, all the work that you're supposed to do. You, you just want to get away from obeying dad. You just want to step out. You just want to do your own thing. Right? Out of anger, that's what we have to picture here. He unjustly criticized David out of a place of anger, accusing him, right, of leaving all of those responsibilities. This is what you should be doing, David, but you're not. Why? Because he was upset with him. He was convicted himself for not taking the stand for what he should be doing. Right? Eliab had done absolutely nothing to defeat the enemies of God. So what did he do? He pointed the blame somewhere else. Well, I know I'm not doing it. He didn't say this, but this is what I read right here. No, I know I'm not doing it, but David, you just came here to watch us fight. You, you just came here to get involved. You just came here to meddle. You just came here to cause trouble. You just came here to get out of doing stuff. Eliab had done nothing. You know, there's an old proverb that says, let the man who says it cannot be done, not disturb the man doing it. I, I love those quotes. I think of that D.L. Moody quote from a few weeks ago um, where basically he says, uh, well, I prefer the way that I'm doing it to the way that you're not. Man, it's so good to understand that. Right? David was challenged not just by his family, though. Those who he held close, I'm sure in somewhat of a high esteem. These are my big brothers. Right? Not only by his family, did he get uh, uh, criticized? But now Saul, Saul challenged him. The ruler, right? The one who was in charge. Saul doubted David's ability on the battlefield. So Saul challenged him. He said, you're but a youth. You're just a youth. How, how, do, you, how do you plan? You know, it's interesting that as you study out things like this, uh, a lot of people will say David was more than likely somewhere between 12 and 17 years of age. I mean, that's a kid, right? Those are the, those are, those are the teens. Right, so here's a, a potentially, we'll say, we'll go in the middle, 14-year-old and a half, right? I, I, I'm 14 and a half. He was just a youth, but God still wanted to use him. Why? To defeat Goliath. Right? This over nine foot tall guy, right? You read it. His spear weighed 65 pounds. His spear was bigger than my son. Like that's, that's one arm. A spear, not a two arm thing. That's crazy to me. And here's a 14 and a half year old, right? Going out to face him, Right? And, and understand this, both of these men, Eliab, even King Saul at the time, they forgot one very important thing. The Lord. God. God's got this. Right? We, we serve a living God. We serve God Almighty. And the men of Israel, the, the, the men in the battle armament, all of these men, even King Saul, they forgot who they were there serving. Number three in your notes there, David's conflict. There was a conflict. You know, it's inevitable that we will face battles. Right? We're not going to draw our swords, more than likely. Put on the chain mail. Right? Most of us will never see uh, some kind of combat scenario in actuality. Right? But we're going to face battles. We're going to face something that uh, maybe we didn't anticipate, something that is shaking us a little bit to the core, right? Our own little giants, people say. 
right? That's when our true character is shown when we are overwhelmed with the circumstances that we're facing. When we face a difficult thing, the way that we respond shows where we're at on a spiritual level. Right? Where are we? Letter A here, David's preparation for battle. David's preparation. I preached a fun sermon to the teens a few years ago, and I said, grab it by the beard. Right? Grab it by the beard. And then it's talking about how David right, prepared for what was ahead in his life. You see, David prepared for the battle with Goliath by facing his smaller battles that he faced in service and in just being obedient in his day-to-day life, right? What happens? He's out in the field and, and a lion comes along, a bear comes along, right? And David faced them with confidence, right? It prepared him for this encounter with Goliath. I'll read you that, just a few verses. 1 Samuel 17, 33 through 37. And Saul said to David, Thou art not able to go against a Philistine to fight with him, for thou art but a youth, and he a man of war from his youth. David said unto Saul, Thy servant kept his father's sheep, and there came a lion and a bear and took a lamb out of the flock. And I went out after him and smote him and delivered it out of his mouth. And when he arose against me, I caught him by his beard and smote him and slew him. Thy servant slew both the lion and the bear. And this uncircumcised Philistine shall be as one of them, seeing he hath defied the armies of the living God. David said, moreover, the Lord that delivered me out of the paw of the lion and out of the paw of the bear, he will deliver me out of the hand of this Philistine. And Saul said unto David, go, the Lord be with thee. Sorry for asking, kid. Go ahead. Sorry for doubting you. Man, that's, I love that story. So you're just a kid. How, why do you think you could go out to battle? Man, I was out there working one day, just being obedient to my dad. And a bear came out and took one of my sheep and I chased after it. And I caught up to that bear and I knocked that sheep out of the mouth and that bear came after me and I just grabbed that thing by the bear beard and I just killed it. What? That's, that's crazy to me, right? We often get this uh, uh, picture of, of David and we're like, well, he probably just worked on throwing those stones out in that field and he probably did, but we uh, visualize in our minds him shooting these stones at these bears and these lions, but no, he said he took that thing right by the beard. How are you going to sling it, right? He just killed that thing. And why, why did that take place? He was showing David who he was. God was allowing David to experience the power and, and the confidence that he could have in who our living God is. It's a powerful thing. God uses every situation, every small battle and trial in our life to prepare us for greater usefulness to him. For, for things up ahead. Right? There, there are situations that I've, I've faced as a youth pastor that I was able to uh, uh, face because of things that I went through as a youth. There, there are things even in the past uh, four months of being pastor of this church that I've been able to express to individuals through counseling and, and through uh, uh, different times of sit down meetings that I've said like this is a situation and, and this is how we can get through it. And God strengthens us through these previous battles for greater usefulness to him. Hey, I don't like it. God never said we would. Battles aren't fun. Right, man, we like to uh, uh, build up these stories in scripture. I can guarantee you David probably would have rather just been tending the sheep. I- I'm going to show up. H- have you ever done that? You-, you showed up to something and you can see a situation happening and you say, why is nobody dealing with this? Why is nobody saying anything? Why is everybody just letting this go by like there's not an issue here? We have to be willing to look at those in the confidence of God and say, this is not going to stand. This is not what God intends for us. David knew his own weakness, right? But through his weakness, he learned learned to depend on God's greatness. 
That's where we're at. David was prepared, right, with proven methods. Saul encouraged David through this process. He's like, man, take, take my armor, take my, take my sword, take my shield. And David's like, no, nah, I'm good. I got this. I, I, I have improved. I've, I've, I've proven this, this sling. I, I've, I've proven this. I, I know that this is trustworthy. I've never operated under what you're trying to make me operate under. Allow me to do it the way that I know. Right? God has proven methods for us as Christians in our lives that have been proven time and time again. And you know what? The Bible is full of these examples to us, these instructions to us for our lives, for church, for everything. And what happens is God's method is always the best one. Why? Because they're proven. We, we can trust this. Thy word is truth. I know that this will work because God said that it will. I know that he answers prayer. Why? Because he said that he does. But he also says that he's not going to answer the prayers of us who are in contention or us or uh, husbands. If we have issue with our wife, God's not going to hear us. Hey, uh, children, we have to obey our parents. Why? All of these things are the process in which God desires to work and show us that my methods are true in your life. My methods are true for you, the same as they were in Old Testament days for David. Let her be here, right? David's power. David's power. We see the preparation, but we see David's power in battle. Goliath was probably the best man that the world at that time could produce. Right, as far as having an advantage, having the weaponry, I mean, a 65 pound spear, right, might as well have been a bazooka, right? I, I mean, th this, is, this is what we're dealing with, and that's probably the best that the world had, and the world is always going to seem to have the advantage. You know, I, I mean, we look out and we see everything that's taken place, and we see, well, the world has the platform to say these things. The world has the intelligence. The world has the, the stronger might. The world has uh, um, the media. The, the, the world has, you, you fill in the blanks, our school systems. The world has the government. The world has all of these things. And on the surface, it looks like these, we could call them, them Goliaths of Satan's army, right? Oh, they're going to win. They're going to prevail against us. We're, we're not going to be able to stand against them. But we got to remember, I mean, with, all thing, with God, all things are possible, right? I mean, I'm getting ahead of myself. Well, all things are possible. I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. But how do I get there? I mean, that, that's a good portion of scripture to, to think about the preparation phase, God, the battles that God brings us to. Because in the verses before Philippians 4.13, right? He talks about how I, Paul, I know how to be a base and how to abound. I, I know how to, to, to live in want and in plenty, right? I believe that's the word that they use. Right? It's interesting because through those things, knowing how to live when I'm in the valleys and live when I'm on the mountains, now I can do all things through Christ because I know that he'll strengthen me. I've proven it. David's power in battle came from his trust in the Lord. It, it came from who he knew God to be in his life. He was confident that God is going to work, right? Right? And, and not just work in the situation, but on the behalf of him as his child. To do what? To conquer the enemy. To make that stained. To be able to accomplish the task ahead of him. I mean, when David was first anointed, even Saul didn't think David would be the one chosen to be king. Even, right, even Samuel, right, not Saul, even Samuel didn't think David would be chosen as king. The brothers ridiculed him when he went to the battlefield. Even Saul at that time, uh, the king of the land, he doubted what this youth could do out on there to defeat this giant of the day. But David knew through what he had gone through, right, I can accomplish this. God, God has built me up. I, I can trust in God for the power and for the victory in my life. Hey, we just sang it. There's power in the blood. 
Did we sing that? Washed. washed in the blood. Hey, we're washed in the blood to have the power in the blood. <laughs> we'll tie it all together. All the hymns are good. Confidence, right? His confidence in God and the care that he provides and the strength that he provides. It was so, uh, I mean, we could use the word intense, right? It was so just present. It was so there, vibrant, right? And he says, you know what? I'm going to take this bold stand for my God. Why? Because he had confidence. Let her see here and we'll close up. David's prevailing. David's prevailing. There was preparation, there was power, and there's prevailing. Goliath came out, right? It says Goliath arose. You know, things are going to arise in our lives constantly. I mean, we all know that there, there's going to be struggle. There's going to, we're going to face something, maybe not today, maybe not tomorrow. Maybe it was yesterday, Right? But whatever it is, we all know we're going to face something. They're going to come up. But the moment that David in scripture, we could see this when he saw Goliath move, what happened was David actually began to run towards him, towards the obstacle, towards the battle, towards the issue that was present in his life. And with those five smooth stones, right, with his slingshot, what happened was David then defeated that giant of the day that giant in his life in that moment. And then what took place, right? God's power was very present and upon him. And he stood for God through the confidence in which he had in God. What, what, what is it that we face today? Because like I, I've said this multiple times from this very place, each one of us is facing something. Right? There's something. There, there's always something. Some kind of giant in our lives. Situational, financial, right? Spiritual battles that we face. All of these things. And we can look to scripture. We can see, man, there's such an amazing power that we have access to. We have to claim it. Right? We serve the same God that David did. We love to tell kids these stories, and yet we face difficulty in our lives. And the kids see us tell them the stories, and man, God is so powerful. But then we face difficulty, and the kids are saying, didn't you just say God was powerful? Why are you giving up? Why did you stop? Dad? Mom? Grandma? Right? Why, why, did you, why, did, why did you just give up? Didn't you say God was, was powerful? We serve that same God. And he will always prove himself to be faithful. Psalms 115. Not unto us, O Lord, not unto us, but unto thy name. Give glory for thy mercy and for thy truth's sake. Wherefore should the heathen say, where is now their God? But our God is in the heavens. He hath done whatsoever he hath pleased. He has done whatsoever he hath pleased. Whatever his decisions, whatever his uh, purpose in our life, that's what he's going to do if we allow him. David's journey for faith here, this journey of faith, it, it, it is showing us that he desired to serve God above everything. Even when he went through times of temptation and failure. Even when he faced difficulty, he was still desiring, right, to serve God above everything else. Sometimes it took him a little bit longer to get around that corner. Oh, I'm, I'm the dummy. Right? But he, he did that. And just like David, when we face difficulties on our journey, what happens? We might feel overwhelmed. We might feel uh, outmanned, so to speak. We, we might feel like we're not ever going to come out of this alive. We're going to be defeated. But God is with us every step of the way. Man, he's there with us. We got to find hope in that. Isaiah 11, 1 through 3, we'll finish with this. It says, and there shall come forth a rod out of the stem of Jesse and a branch shall grow out of his roots and the spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him. The spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and of the fear of the Lord and shall make him a quick 
of quick understanding in the fear of the Lord, and he shall not judge after the sight of his eyes, neither reprove after the hearing of his ears. This is who we serve. Right? The spirit of wisdom, understanding, counsel, might, knowledge. That's a powerful God. That's a powerful God. What giants are you facing? Give it to God. Give it to God. That's who we serve. Let's close in prayer and then we'll take a few prayer requests tonight. Lord, I'm just thankful for your word. I'm thankful for these um, character studies that we're able to look to, that we're able to, to see kind of how they handled the situations that they dealt with in life and how we can then apply them to our lives, Lord. I just think of the, the many situations that we face and some of great concern to us. Lord, help us just remember who we serve, who we're the child of to keep you in your rightful place. Lord, and help us to stay in service to you and trust to you. We praise you for it in Jesus' name. Amen.